So I literally got in the back of a police car. They put handcuffs on me. And I remember looking out the back window at my mom and dad, and this was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. My mom is the oldest child of Billy and Ruth Graham, the Reverend Billy Graham, which makes Billy Graham my maternal grandfather. And the flavor of Christianity that was expressed in my home growing up was not legalistic or oppressive. It was fun, but I couldn't really figure out where I fit inside my family. And when you're young and desperately trying to fit in somewhere and you can't figure out where you fit inside the home, you try to figure that out outside the home. So I started hanging out with people I shouldn't have been hanging out with and doing things I shouldn't have been doing. And all of that culminated at the ripe young age of 16 when my lifestyle had become so disruptive to the rest of the family that my parents were left with no choice but to say, if you're gonna keep living this way, you can't live this way under our roof. So I started living on my own uh, with friends and was just, I mean, was just a wild man. A wild man when it came to girls, a wild man when it came to drugs. There was very, very little that I would not do. Very little. My mom and dad were well loved in our community, and so there were lots of friends they had who wanted to help them as they were going through the things that they were going through with me. I can particularly remember two different men. First guy came over to my mom and dad's house and he picked me up. Felt a little awkward sitting in Burger King with this guy um, who I didn't really know very well. And for about an hour, he basically read me the riot act. Told me that I was ruining my life. Told me that I was hurting my mom and dad. Well, I, within the first five minutes of our conversation, knew where the conversation was going. Knew that it wouldn't be much of a conversation at all, and I just, I tuned the guy out. About a year later, another guy approached my mom and dad, and I thought to myself, oh no, not again. So he called me, he said, listen, I know that life is a little confusing right now, I know that your relationship with your mom and dad isn't great. If there's ever anything you need, I'm here for you. If there's something you want to tell someone and you don't want to tell your parents, consider me a confidant. If you get into a jam financially, let me know. I'll be happy to help. And then he changed the subject and spent the rest of the time talking to me about sports or whatever. And I remember leaving that conversation feeling very, very differently. The previous guy made me feel accused and even if the accusations are correct, which in his case they were, when you're accused, you run. You run away. The second guy made me feel loved unconditionally. And even though you might know you're guilty, when you feel unconditionally loved, you don't run away, you run toward. I mean, I was at that point now doing things serious things that I would have never dreamed about doing even when I was 16 and I left home initially. I went to jail a couple of times, always breaking the law. My conscience was very, very numb. The further you walk down that road, the easier it becomes to get deeper and deeper and deeper into the dark waters that you wake up one day and go, how did I end up here? How did I end up doing this? Uh, my life is a mess. What am I doing? What, what, I mean, seriously, what am I doing? It wasn't one particular circumstance. It was just this growing, deepening sense that something's missing big time. I had done everything the world had told me to do and had pursued everything the world had told me to pursue in order to find happiness and meaning and significance. And I was emptier and lonelier at 21 than I had been when I started off on this quest back at 14, 15, 16 years old. So um, I just started going back to church where I was being told Jesus paid it all. 
that the pressure's off. You don't need to secure for yourself meaning and value and happiness. Jesus already secured all of those things for you on the cross and now gives those things to you free of charge. And hearing that week after week, combined with being beat up by the do more, try harder message of the world, was what God used to save me. The father of the prodigal son in Luke 15 fell to his knees and wrapped his arms around his son's legs as he was coming home, not as he was leaving. And lots of parents do it as their child is leaving, trying to do everything in their power to get them to stay. And the prodigal son's father was wise. He let him go. My mom and dad were wise. They let me go. They knew that only God could make the changes that needed to be made. And what singularly attracted me back to God when I was 21 years old was his love for me evidenced and embodied in the love that my mom and dad had for me. The way they loved me was such an accurate picture of the way God loves sinners that I knew I could go home and be received. I knew that even after everything I had done, I could go home and be welcomed.